I think many 60 symbols viewers will know that once you get down to the quantum level, the atomic molecular, the single particle level, you've got to start taking in this weird, and it is weird, um, characteristic, the particles start to behave like waves. It's not to say they are waves, but they start to have wave-like characteristics. It's sort of obvious that there are going to be natural links to other waves, and in particular sound waves, because what's music? Music is just sound waves. And it's just how different sound waves interact, different resonances, different notes, etc. How those different frequencies play together and play off each other. The first time people come across the uncertainty principle is the idea of um, position and momentum. That if we know the position of something with a certain accuracy, we have less accuracy in measuring its momentum and vice versa. And now often that is painted as a problem with the measurement. But it's not a problem with the measurement, it's just fundamentally due to the properties of waves. What I'm going to do now is hit the string and just take my hand away and let's listen to what, what happens. You know what's going to happen. So the note lasts for a long time. There's a quite a lot of distortion on it, so it'll, it'll take quite some time to decay off. But I'm not touching it. And it's just coming to a natural end to its vibration just in terms of how the energy's dissipated. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do what all good metal guitarists do. And instead of just letting the note ring out like that, I'm going to damp it with the palm of my hand. So I'm going to put it on the bridge. And now when I hit the guitar, you're going to get that classic metal chug. Just like that. Just. So you're denying it the opportunity to continue vibrating? Yes, exactly. I'm denying it the opportunity to, to keep vibrating. And so we've got the key difference here, not a very subtle difference, we've got a difference between a note that extends for a long period of time and a note that's, what we say is time limited. Just simply as technical language to say that it just lasts a short amount of time. Right, so the question now is when we look at the frequency spectrum of these notes, what do they look like? So we can, we can look at the, the wave in time, and we can look at it in frequency. And before we look at the, the frequency spectrum of that, let's look at a really simple example. And this is almost an example you could do at home. If we just whistle a note. We whistle it for a long time. Now, interestingly, a whistled note is about as close to a sine wave as you're gonna get. This is how its amplitude varies its time. And it looks pretty much like a pure sine wave. And then if we look at its frequency, we convert this from time on this axis to frequency in this axis, then we get a sharp spike because it's only one sine wave. It's only one pure frequency. Say for want of argument, it's middle C. Now if I whistle middle C, and you play middle C on piano, or you play middle C on guitar, then clearly our ear can detect the difference, but yet it's still the same note. So what is it about the waveform that means our, our ear and our brain, obviously, can determine the difference. Because this is classically, this is how we're always told, this is what waves like, look like, they're the sine wave. It's very straightforward, if you've got a low note, oh, then you've got a small number of vibrations per second, if you've got a high note, ah, then you've got a large number of vibrations per second. But it's, there's obviously got to be something more to it than that, because if that's all there was to it, then every note would sound like a whistle. And so if we whistle, you know, at different frequencies, then what will happen is that the note will move around, the frequency will move around. I think many of you know this. but. If we look at a guitar string, it's a lot more complicated than a sine wave. And that's because when we look at the frequency spectrum of this, many different frequencies contribute to give you that sound. That's how your ear determines the difference because your ear can hear all those different frequencies and how they interact. And it's that that gives you the timbre of the note. Where am I going with this? Let's take that really distorted guitar sound. Now that's a lot more complicated than either a whistle or an undistorted guitar. So you might expect that its frequency spectrum might look fairly complicated. So we take that long note and play it. That's what it looks like in time. And if we take a frequency spectrum, it's a fairly, you can hear it, it's a fairly, what we'd say is harmonically rich sound. And you get all these different harmonics. It's a bit like looking at a house that's been made of bricks or stones. You'd say both of them are a house, but they look completely different. That's exactly it. That's precisely it, yeah. It's just a different way, a different representation of the data. The key thing is if you look at those peaks, they're fairly sharp, they're fairly sharp spikes. Let's just zoom in on one of those peaks, just one of those particular harmonics. And if we look at that, this is what it looks like. This is from our, our very strong guitar signal, the very distorted guitar signal, where we let the note ring out for a long time, and it looks like this. It's very sharp. 
So here's the key, here's the uncertainty principle. You've waited a long time for this, but here's the uncertainty principle. Wide in time, narrow in frequency. That's it. Wide in time, narrow in frequency. I've not mentioned an observer. I've not mentioned quantum particles. I've not mentioned collapse of wave function. I've simply shown you in the everyday world around us, this is the uncertainty principle. So, because if it's wide in time, we've got a fair amount of uncertainty as to, as to where it is. If I let that note ring out for a long time, we're uncertain. When did it start? When did it end? And in fact, if you let that note ring for all eternity, literally, and we do lots of integrals like this in physics, which go from minus infinity to plus infinity, then this will be infinitesimally narrow. So infinitely wide, infinitesimally narrow. But when you chug, you're saying the frequency is less certain? Precisely. So if we look at this again, here's our long note. So what I'm going to do now is show you the frequency spectrum for the short note. It's the same string I'm hitting. All I'm doing is instead of letting it ring out for a long time, I'm, I'm compressing it in time. I'm chugging. <sighs> don't. That's it, just that don't. And you can almost hear, so actually, it's a little bit more difficult to distinguish what the tone is there. If we look at that in the frequency spectrum, instead of it being this very sharp peak, it's broadened out. And you might think, well, that seems really strange. Why should it broaden out? Why should you need more frequencies when fundamentally you're hitting the same string? Narrow in time, wide in frequency. And you might think, well, why is that? Because it's the same, fundamentally, it's the same note. But due to a brilliant, literally brilliant physicist and mathematician, a guy called Fourier, for those of you who speak French, I apologize. And he told us that practically any signal, or certainly any signal, or any waveform, or any pattern that physicists care about, can be represented by a sum of signs. That's it. So you take that really simple sine wave, if you add up enough of them, and you add up enough of them in the right way in terms of changing the frequency, and changing the amplitude, and changing what's called the phase in terms of how they line up, you can produce any signal. To create that signal, what we need to do is add up many more sine waves than to create the signal where the wave extends for a long time. Go back and think about that whistle. That's just, you've got this whistle that's lasting for a long time. That's a pure sine tone. Even if we were to take that whistle and instead of going <whistles> we just cut it off and we go <whistles> like that. So something equivalent to the chug here. What we're going to have to do to represent that in terms of the frequencies, because we have to represent that cutoff, is we're going to have to add in new frequencies to the mix. Because Fourier tells us that any pattern is a sum of signs. So we need more building blocks to make a short note. Because it has a start and an end. Because it has a start and an end. Ah. Okay. Brady, can you, can you just say that again? Because that's, I think it's, <laughs> that you've reached that realization is an important thing. Just say that again, because I think that's. You said it. You said it. <laughs> because I thought a short note would need you... less information to describe itself. If you've got a sign, if, if what you're doing, if your basic building block is a sine wave, and you, you, your pattern just looks like one sine wave, and it extends for all infinity, then you've just got one in the mix. If, however, your basic building block is a sine wave, and it is, and you've got something that no longer looks like a sine wave because it cuts off, then you have to add more building blocks. But that's really counterintuitive. If you've got a note that is finite, it is not going to have an infinitesimally narrow frequency spectrum. It's going to have a finite width. It will have a finite width. Because it's, it's in the real universe, we don't have infinities and we don't have infinitesimal quantities. So any, any real note will have a finite width. But the shorter you make that note, and I stress that again, this is the uncertainty principle, the shorter you make that note, the wider its frequency spectrum becomes. Moreover, what you have is you're, in one case you've got time, and in the other case you've got frequency. Now this is important, it's a re it seems like a, um, a really trite point, but if more undergraduate students, because I didn't, I didn't grasp this until I think I got to third or fourth year, more undergraduate students got this, I think that it would make Fourier analysis and quantum a lot easier. We've got time. What's a unit of time? Seconds. What's a unit of frequency? Hertz. One over seconds. So they're inversely related. So, you know, if you've got, uh, you've got seconds and you've got seconds to the minus one. So it sort of makes sense that if you widen in one domain, you're going to narrow in the other domain because time and frequency are inversely related. A good way to think of it is that frequency is reciprocal time because what we're about to get onto is space and reciprocal space. Because I don't see how this relates to a particle's position and momentum. So that's where exactly where we're going now. So you've got that, we've, got, we've covered this idea of frequency and time. How does that relate to position and momentum? Well, let me introduce this wonderful band called Striper. Why the hell am I bringing up Striper? Well, what I want to do is focus on these stripes. So what we have here is a pattern that repeats in space. What is this representing? What could it be? Like? It could be, you know, you've got to see these periodic patterns everywhere around us. And particularly, you know, you look at carpet, you look at wallpaper. 
Those are tiling patterns. There's a periodicity there. There's a repeating unit. It could be spandex pants. And it could be spandex pants. So we can work out very easily what the repeat period is. Let's say, for want of argument, it says 23 centimeters. And what's the repeat? So the repeat unit here is there to there. So that's nine. So in terms of our period in space, we've got nine centimeters. Let's put that period and we'll put a little less to represent space. So that's our spatial period. We can write down a spatial frequency which is how many of these do we get per meter? And we, let's, let's be good and let's convert this to meters. So our spatial frequency is gonna be one over 0 0.09 meters. And that's gonna have units meters to the minus one. This is units meters, this is units meters to the minus one. Our whistle had units seconds and our frequency spectrum had units seconds to the minus one. Time, reciprocal time, space, reciprocal space. Once we've got a wave in space, we can write down a particular spatial frequency. We can have a spatial frequency which is relatively low or a spatial frequency which is relatively high. How does this finally connect with quantum? And it's exactly the same idea now if I, in terms of the uncertainty principle, if I have a wave in space and I compress that wave in space, so it's, it's not extending for a long time and it's not repeating, then I will correspondingly have a broader spatial frequency spectrum. Right? How the heck does that come into quantum mechanics? The way it comes into quantum mechanics is this. Momentum is equal to Planck's constant over wavelength. Right? But notice that it's over wavelength. It's one over wavelength, which means it must have units meters to the minus one. So another way of... Of, of thinking about momentum is that momentum is spatial frequency. It's the number of repeats in space. And so you've got a particle which is a higher frequency will have a higher momentum in terms of its, its quantum wave. If that quantum wave is a higher frequency, it will have a higher momentum. And that, that's where the link comes. We're talking about waves. It doesn't matter if they're waves in time or waves in space. The uncertainty principle isn't this magic formula that's been plucked out because of quantum, because everything's quantum. It's fundamentally due to, to waves. And it doesn't matter if we look at the waves in the quantum regime or in the classical regime in the world around us, it's the same physics. So, de Broglie tells us that we've got this inverse relationship between momentum and wavelength. How does that in turn relate to the uncertainty principle which tells us about position and momentum? It tells us that the, the, the more accurately we know the position, the less accurately we know the momentum. The, the important thing here is that Again, it's an inverse relationship. It's just like the relationship between frequency, frequency and time. It's that one is the inverse of the other. So if you compress, if you know something more accurately in space, in terms of momentum, it broadens out in momentum. Your uncertainty is broader in momentum. It's exactly the same as when we had that whistled note. When that whistled note extends for a long time, which means that if you think about that instead of time now, you think of it in space, you think about your particle extending for a long time, it means you've got a massive amount of uncertainty in knowing where that position is. But if you think about it in terms of reciprocal space, which as de Broglie shows us is directly related to momentum, it's incredibly well known. It's a single spike and vice versa. What are the building blocks with all our atoms and things? What a beautiful question, Brady. They're exactly the same. It's exactly the same Fourier analysis. We're doing the build up. It doesn't matter if we're talking about musical notes or quantum mechanical particles. It's waves. It's waves, and therefore we use the same type of analysis. We waves use Fourier of analysis. Waves of what? Well, there's the question. They're probability waves. In quantum mechanics, they're probability waves. And in fact, do we know truly there are like 25 different interpretations of what those waves actually mean? We don't know that. That's a big unanswered question in quantum, but we know they're waves. And in fact, we can do these experiments. We can build up effectively little guitar strings with atoms. And we can look at how the electrons are arranged in those, and they are literally arranged as in guitar strings. <laughs> So with the music example at the start of this video, the building blocks were sound waves, they were, you know, c compression of air. Yeah. With atoms and momentum and things like that, they're waves of somethingness that we don't understand. The waves that, well, we have something in quantum mechanics called a wave function, and we can build that wave function up just as we build up different sound waves. We can build up different wave functions for a system by adding in different sine waves. When we square that, and we square it in a particular way, then what we get is a probability wave. 
And so, yes, there are things we don't understand, but what we do know, and this is important, sometimes quantum is seen to be, well, the scientists don't really know what's going on, everything's weird, some things are weird, but an awful lot we do understand. And we can do the maths and we can treat those, those particles in terms of wave-like properties, and it works beautifully. We get these incredible analogues to the sound of our very heavily distorted guitar. Thanks for watching this video. For more Phil physics, and heavy metal music, why don't you check out his new book? This is it. When the Uncertainty Principle Goes to Eleven. It's out now, illustrations by Pete McPartland, who also does a lot of the animations here on 60 Symbols. Also, check out Phil in a recent episode of my podcast, The Unmade Podcast. In it, Phil throws around a few ideas of his own for podcasts, including one called When Scientists Go to Seed, which is all about, well, when scientists start having a few loopy ideas that maybe they shouldn't. Check it out, there are links on the screen and in the video description. Phil, did you ever used to dress like this? I didn't dress like this, no. I was more of the thrash metal brigade. I wasn't quite of the hair metal. Um, I'm immensely follic follically challenged now. But that wasn't in, always the case, that, people. Look at the picture on the screen. <laughs>